Heavenly Father, as we come before you this morning, uh, we ask that you bless us with your presence through the Holy Spirit, pour your latter rain out upon us, that you'd take control of my words, um, that what I share will be clear and concise, and that you would bless those that are listening to this, um, whether they're listening live or hereafter on the YouTube, uh, that they can uh, keep up with this information as it's unfolding so quickly now, in Jesus' name, amen. I sent in the notes and then I thought of a couple quotes that I wanted to start with. So you have two handouts, one, one's called Step Fast, and one is the notes. And there's Adventist ministries and schools and stuff that have used these two quotes um, to represent, you know, their their schools or the, the theme of their school. Um, and the first one is from early writing. It says, And I saw what we must be in order to inherit glory, and then saw how much Jesus had suffered to obtain for us so rich an inheritance. I prayed that we might be baptized into Christ's sufferings, that we might not shrink at trials, but bear them with patience and joy, knowing that what Jesus, Jesus had suffered, that we through his poverty and suffer, sufferings might be made rich. Now here's the point. Said the angel, Deny self, you must step fast. The bottom line of this is stepping fast. Some of us have had time to get the truth and advance step by step, and every step we've taken has given us strength to take the next. But now, time is almost finished. And what we've been years learning, they will have to learn in a few months. They will also have much to unlearn and much to learn again. Those who would not receive the mark of the beast in his image when the decree goes forth must have a decision now to say, nay, we will not regard the institution of the beast. So we have to step fast in the last few months, and that's where we're at. May, June, July, two months. Um, the next quote from Manuscript Releases, I'm going to drop down to, like, I think it's the third sentence from the end, where it says, it is a disgrace. <clears throat> in the center of the paragraph, third sentence from the bottom. It is a disgrace for those who have been in the truth for years to talk of feeding souls who've been months in truth upon milk. Okay. It's a disgrace for those of us that have been in the message for years <clears throat> to, to consider the idea of now what we need to do is feed milk to the people. Okay. It's much too late for milk. It shows they know little of the leadings of the Spirit of the Lord and realize not the time we're living in. Those who embrace the truth now will have to step fast. They'll have to be breaking up, be a breaking up of the heart before the Lord, a rending of the heart and not the garment. So, if you're going to keep up with the unfolding message, you have the responsibility through your own efforts to keep up with the, the theology, the intellectual part of the message, but you also better be breaking down before the Lord and getting victory in your own experience. So it's two things there, but so I'm going to step fast here. I have um, 12 pages of notes, and what it led me to go with this step fast quote is I'm not going to do them like I usually do. This is basically bullet points, okay? I'm going to comment very briefly on each of the paragraphs. But before I do, up here, um, and this is part of stepping fast, uh, the Lord used Brother, our, our lone student at this point in time here at the school, used him to, to recognize the triple application of prophecy. And if you've been watching... The presentation sept since September 7th, there was a presentation where I made an argument, and I've made it more than once in these presentations September 7th, that the, the main rule that was given to us as the 14 rules were given to William Miller was a triple application of prophecy. And you can go back into that our history and show that in every major revelation of truth, it was a triple application of prophecy that cemented that truth in place. Okay, so that's in the record. If, you don't, if you're not familiar with what I'm saying, you need to go back and look it over and step fast. So what Brother Emmanuel noticed 
is a triple application of prophecy and he has more to say about this than I have to say about it and I'm not going to say much about it today. What I'm doing is I'm putting it in the record and I'm going to move away from it. But you need to start, you need to get familiar with it so when, it, when the Lord leads us back to this, I'm certain that this line here is the line of the priest and then the Levites. I'm certain this is going to be the point of reference where we bring these chiasms in and, and everything gets established. But disregard the blue here, okay? This is a basic history of Adventism as we've always structured the lines. This is a basic history of the priests as we've always structured the line. And this is a basic history of the Levites, okay? And when you line them up, line up on line, it becomes a triple application of prophecy. And the same rules that we've always used on a triple application of prophecy make this third fulfillment of the Levites airtight. But the purpose of making this airtight is to bring the Levite line up here, right here, as an extension of the priests and Levites. Okay, so what you're seeing is darkness precedes uh, the, the Millerite movement from 538 to 1798, 1260 years. I, and I'm disregarding way marks here of the increase of knowledge in Miller, but I'm just marking the way mark of Islam when Islam was restrained in 1840 on August 11th and the angel of Revelation 10 comes down with the little book open in his hand. This says Bible before here. What that means is they, the Millerites knew in advance of the event from the Bible that it was going to take place. So Bible before the event. They knew it. Um, I have 1022 here, but this is, 1022 gets really complex, so I'm just putting it in there as a, as a very simple way mark at this time. And it leads to 1863 in Millerite history and Advent history. And this begins their descent into darkness, uh, 126 years. Uh, the center point, 1926, giving us two periods of two different types of darkness, internal darkness problems brought up on them by themselves, beginning with them setting aside these two tables, which were typified by the two Ten Commandments. And therefore, when they set aside these two tables, um, it is the image of jealousy. Um, it it's also symbolizes a Sunday law, okay? Because the attack on the two tables at the end of the world is a Sunday law, and I, I have other witness for that. That's why I have the Sunday law there. Um, and then the close of probation for them is 1989, as we have shown repeatedly, the time of the end in 1989, close of probation for Adventism. They still have some progressive falling to do, but you remember the quote from Desire of Ages, that at the birth of Christ, uh, the Hebrew church, the leaders were passed by. In 1989, Adventism was passed by. That is an agreement with the line upon line study of covenant people. There is always a covenant people that are passed by when the Lord is entering into covenant with a new covenant people, that being the 144,000. So this is the basic line that I'm pointing you to. There's more to it than this. Uh, Adventism, you have 126 years here of darkness. You got darkness at the beginning, darkness at the end. So what we do here is we take this 126 years and we bring it down here. This is that darkness, 126 years to 1989. And there you are, there you are at the time of the end, 1798, 1989. And there you are, 9-11, the waymark of Islam lines up with the waymark of Islam in Millerite history. And here, through the spirit of prophecy, after the event, we could see 9-11. theory, we could have seen it in advance, but we didn't. Through the spirit of prophecy, Testimonies, Volume 9, page 11, you can refer to that, but that isn't really what we've seen it in. What we really were awakened to it is the passage where Sister White says, when the great buildings of New York City are thrown down by a touch of God, then Revelation 18, 1 through 3 will be fulfilled. And we already knew that 9-11 was a fulfillment of Revelation 18, 1 through 3. So after that of, of Islamic waymark, the spirit of prophecy speaks to it. Okay, with the triple application of prophecy, you take two lines and you combine them, saying that at this line down here, you're going to have the Bible and spirit of prophecy and you're going to have a before and after. But in any case, on this way mark up here, 1022, 1844 lines up with 1022, 2014. Uh, this is what I'm saying is here and here there's some complexity. I'm not dealing with it right now. But 
our darkness at the end of our history as priests. This is the line of the priest. Our darkness is midnight, a midnight darkness from September 7th, 2019 to November 9th, 2019 to January 11th, 2020. Uh, so this darkness becomes the darkness that precedes the line of the Levite. So I'm taking this darkness, 126 days, putting it here, and you'll see for Millerite history, 1260 years of darkness. For the priest, 126 years of darkness. And for the Levites, 126 days of darkness. Years, uh, 1260 years, 126 years, 126 days. Okay, that takes you to the time of the end. Uh, 1989, it's 1798, they're both right there. This is the time of the end, but it's the time of the end for the Levites. And so they're going to have an Islamic way mark that is illustrated by these two lines and that Islamic way, way mark for the Levites is July 18th 2020 and they're going to hear about it before because this month we're going to put in the public record this warning so before the event they're going to hear about it or have the opportunity to be led to hear about it through the Holy Spirit and after the conviction is going to come in hey this was true Okay, and that's what's going to call, bring the Levites out. So you got the before and after, and it's going to be based upon the Bible and spirit of prophecy. It's going to, I have this in orange because this way mark here in, in Levite history, it's going to be there. And this is what I'm saying. When we start plugging in the chiasms and the wheels within the wheels that we're recognizing from other studies, this way mark will be marked clearly before this Sunday law of December 25th, 2021, and I'm saying that 9-7 is a Sunday law, because 9-7 is 1863, and don't miss that 1863 on the Millerite line is 63, and 9 times 7 is 63, that's followed by 63 days, it's followed by 63 days, it's followed by 63 weeks. 1863 is lining up here, so I'm saying that 9-7 was a Sunday law for the priests, and up here from 1863 to 1989 takes you to the close of probation for Adventism. And from September 7th to January 11th takes you to the close of probation for the foolish priests, for the Omega movement. This is the close of their probation. Okay, and you put this down here. This is the darkness for the Levites. So here, this Sunday law, 1225, is lining up with this way mark, is lining up with this way mark. This was 126 years. This was 126 days. And Revelation 17 tells us that this is one hour. However, the one hour is reflected by the 126 days or the 126 years. So what I'm saying is the purpose of this triple application of prophecy is to make these waymarks immovable, but what we need to do then is take this line and bring it up here. Okay, this is the story of the priest and the Levites. That's why I have this in blue. And this line of the priests and Levites is going to become a point of reference as we proceed through these studies. Um, but you have to have confidence that these waymarks are valid and your confidence comes from a triple application of prophecy. Okay, so all I'm doing here is putting this in the record uh, for those of you that choose to step fast to get that in your mind for when we come back to it. Just one simple point. You have said in the past, and I believe it, it has to apply here, that the first two lines define the third one. Yep. Yep. Yeah, one plus... One, uh, one plus two equals three um, upon the testimony of two things established. By the way, the beginning of this darkness is the, the Sunday Law in 538. Okay, so once you see that 1863 is an attack against the law of God based upon that these two tables were typified by the Ten Commandments, and you go back into that history, when Moses was given the Ten Commandments, what was Aaron doing? He was making the image of jealousy. So the image of jealousy is a Sunday law. So I, I just want you to see that this way, Mark, it's, it's solid on lots of witnesses that the beginning of the darkness is a Sunday law. And therefore, September 7th, the Omega movement began to manifest 
its character at the Sunday Law, and it was a character prepared for the mark of the beast. Um, okay, so I have to step fast here. I'm still working on the kingdom of the beast in Daniel 11, and I went into some chiasms before I finished it up, um, but I'm heading back there now, but I'm going to step fast. Okay, I've been telling you probably two or three times along the way when I stepped out of my material, don't forget these passages where Sister White references Zechariah chapter 5. Remember the, the role that, that goes around the world? And then the two unclean birds put the papacy in her spot in Zechariah chapter 5. Okay, she, we had quotes there. And the first quote that we've looked at is on page one of your notes. And we're going to step fast. All I want you to see, I want you to see it all, but all I'm going to take time to address is that on the first paragraph of these three paragraphs, uh, the bold face on the bottom says, There are many who are in the same condition of mind today as was David, but if they would go into the sanctuary and understand the latter end of the wicked, they would be no more envious of them. Okay? We're supposed to, at midnight, go into the sanctuary, see the wheels within the wheels, and what we're supposed to understand is the latter end of the wicked. Okay? And their end is when their cup of probation is fulfilled. So if you drop down to the third paragraph then, after she quotes from Zechariah 5, she says, the angel is represented through the midst, as flying through the midst of heaven with a roll in his hand, on which are written the deeds of our daily life. God bears long with the children of men, but there is a time coming when he will cease to bear with, bear with them. So what I want you to see is Sister White is putting the story of Zechariah 5 at the time period where probationary time is closed up. Okay, and if you want to understand when the wicked of the priests probationary time closed up, then you have to go in the sanctuary, and you go into the sanctuary on November 9th, 2019. And being in midnight, you can see the end of the wicked priests. Okay, so, and, but you got to go in there to see the end of every, every b b element that gets their probation finished off, their cup fulfilled, because it's all on these lines, okay? So I'm saying that Zechariah 5 is at the time period in Earth's history when the cup of probationary time is filling up. And now I want to walk you through the chapters that lead to chapter 5 in Zechariah. And this is old news. I've taught Zechariah uh, 1 through 6 for tw over 20 years. So this is a matter of public record, so I'm going to step fast. Chapter 1 is about God's mercy and His jealousy. And I've been throwing my voice out into the mix now for a few weeks saying, pay attention to what Elder Daniel was teaching about God's jealousy. Because I knew I was coming here too. This is a, a subject. It's His character. His character is identified in the second commandment. And in Zechariah chapter 1, it says God is jealous for Jerusalem that's been trodden down for 70 years. Where's Jerusalem trodden down for 70 years? On those three lines from 538 to 1798, from 1863 to 1989, and from September 7th to January 11th. Okay, and he's going to have mercy on them, and he's going to do a work that is symbolized by his jealousy. That's chapter 1 of Zechariah. And then you have a second witness to it, if you're not familiar with it. In Ezekiel 39, 25-29 it says, um, let me read first Zechariah 1, 12 through 14. Then the angel of the Lord answered and said, O Lord of hosts, how long will thou not have mercy on Jerusalem? against which thou hast had indignation these threescore and ten years. So the angels that commune with me, saying, Cry thou, saying, Thus saith the Lord, Horse, I, I'm jealous for Jerusalem and for Zion with great jealousy. How long will you not have mercy? Because they've been in darkness for, 120, for 1260 years, or 126 years, or 126 days. How long will you not have mercy? But he's jealous, okay? And 
And Ezekiel is going to tell us the same thing for a second witness. Therefore, thus saith the Lord, now will I bring, bring again, bring again in the Hebrew means reverse. Now will I reverse the captivity of Jacob and have mercy upon the whole house of Israel, and I will be jealous for my holy name. After that they have borne their shame and all their trespasses, where they have trespassed against me. When they dwell safely in their land, and none made them afraid. When I have brought them again from the people and gathered them out of the enemy's lands, and am sanctified in them in the sight of many nations. Then they will know that I am the Lord their God. You have to know that you are His people. You have to know this is the message. That's what it means that then you will know that I am the Lord. You have to know, okay? Which caused them to be led into captivity among the heathen, but I have gathered them out, uh, unto their own land. He caused us to go into captivity. When did we go into captivity? March 27th, 2019. Okay, step fast. Neither will I hide my face anymore from them, for I have poured my spirit upon the house of Israel. Okay, so when he's going to have mercy on Jerusalem, he's going to pour his spirit upon them. Chapter 2 now is the choosing of Jerusalem. I just took a couple verses out of chapter 2 of Zechariah. And the Lord shall inherit Judah, his portion in his holy land, and shall choose Jerusalem again. Be silent, O all flesh, for the Lord, for he is raised up out of his holy habitation. When the Lord stands up, it's a change of dispensation. And when he chooses Jerusalem again, he is setting aside Jerusalem of old and choosing Jerusalem. When does he choose Jerusalem? At the midnight cry, because that's when Ezra gets to Jerusalem. At the midnight cry, he is setting aside old Jerusalem and choosing new Jerusalem. Okay, so where was the midnight cry for us? Where is the midnight cry for us? What is the midnight cry for us? Well, the the counterfeit always precedes the true, and the counterfeit midnight cry is marked by the counterfeiters as taking place on August 29th, 2019. And the true midnight cry comes at midnight, and midnight began at 9-7-2019 through 1-11-2020. That's the midnight cry time period. And when you get to 1-11, he's opened that message up. Okay? So, he's going to choose Jerusalem when? He chose Jerusalem during midnight. He selected this group of 300 from September 7th to January 11th. He has chosen Jerusalem. He's made a distinction between the wise priest and the foolish priest, between the wicked priest and the wise priest, depending on which adjectives you want to use. Okay, he made that selection in that history. Chapter 3 of Zechariah, what am I doing? I'm giving you the four chapters that lead to chapter 5. Chapter 5 is where the cup is filled and the roll is going throughout a whole earth. Okay, chapter 1 is how long until you have mercy on Jerusalem. Chapter 2 is I'm going to choose Jerusalem again. And chapter 3, just a couple verses out of it. And he showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord and Satan standing at his right hand to resist him. And the Lord said unto Satan, The Lord rebuke thee, O Satan, even the Lord that hath, past, past tense, hath chosen Jerusalem. Rebuke thee, is this not a brand plucked out of the fire? When the Lord chooses Jerusalem in Zechariah 3, is Joshua the high priest righteous? Yes. He is. You're gonna, he's going to claim that he is. I'm going to say he's made righteous because in chapter 3, if you read it, what is he wearing? Mm -hmm. Filthy garments. And he's going to be changed in that point. And when the changing from the filthy garments to the righteous garments is a brand being plucked out of the fire. What fire is he plucked out of? The fire of Malachi 3. I will purify the sons of Levi as gold and silver with a fire. When does he purify them? When does the brand get plucked out of the fire? 
from 9-7 to January 11th, he is choosing Jerusalem right then. That's when they're getting plucked out of the fire. The priests. The, the, the prophets and kings 587, Zechariah's vision of Joshua and the angel applies with peculiar force to the experience of God's people in the closing scenes of the great day of atonement. The remnant church will then be brought into great trial and, and distress. Is November 9th, was November 9th the closing scenes of the great day of atonement? Well, we got two witnesses that say yes. From October 22nd, 1844 to November 9th, 1849, you can show that that is the Day of Atonement. One day equaled 1844 days, 20 hours, 33 minutes, and 15 seconds. And if you take that history and, and take it to October 22nd, 2014, the same day, the same time period takes you to November 9th, 2019. Right in the center of midnight, where I'm saying he is choosing Jerusalem and plucking a brand out of the fire, right in that point in time, Sister White says, Zechariah chapter 3 refer, few, refers to the closing scenes of the Day of Atonement. Okay, that's chapter 3. Now, this is from Great Controversy about chapter 3. And to the accuser of his people, he declares, The Lord rebuke thee, O Satan, even the Lord that hath chosen Jerusalem rebuke thee, is this not a brand plucked out of the fire? Christ will clothe his faithful ones with his own righteousness that he may present them to his Father, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or anything. A glorious church, that's Jerusalem, New Jerusalem. Their names stand enrolled in the book of life, and concerning them it is written, They shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. Thus will be realized the complete fulfillment of the new covenant promise I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. In those days, and in that time, saith the Lord, the iniquity of Israel shall be sought for, and there shall be none, and the sins of Judah, and they shall not be found. In that day shall the branch of the Lord be beautiful and glorious, and the fruit of the earth shall be excellent and comely for them that are escaped of Israel. And it shall come to pass that he it that is left in Zion, and he that remaineth in Jerusalem shall be called holy, even every one that is written among the living in Jerusalem. The work of the investigative judgment and the blotting out of sins is to be accomplished before, not at, before the second advent of the Lord. Since the dead are to be judged out of the things written in the book, it is impossible that the sins of men should be blotted out until after the judgment at which their cases are to be investigated. But the Apostle Peter distinctly states that the sins of believers will be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord and He shall send Jesus Christ. When He's choosing Jerusalem, He pours out His latter rain. When did he pour out his latter rain in the history of the priests? In the midnight chiasm. It reaches its, the midnight cry is established in there on, by <coughs> January 11th. He's pouring out his, 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 are all the priests that come to September 7th and enter into this midnight history, are they, are, do they already have a perfected character? No, they go in there with filthy garments, and he's going to pluck them out of the fire. All right? When the investigative judgment closes, Christ will come and his reward will be with him to every man as his work shall be. Chapter 1 of Zechariah, how long till you have mercy on Jerusalem? Chapter 2, I'm going to choose Jerusalem again. Chapter 3, it's about the people that are going to represent Jerusalem. Um, and in Joel, Joel chapter 2, verses 15 to 20, it says, Blow the trumpet in Zion, sanctify a fast, call a solemn assembly, gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children, and those that suck their breasts. Let the bridegroom go forth of his chamber and the bride out of her closet. Let the priests... 
The ministers of the Lord weep between the porch and the altar and let them say, Spare thy people, O Lord, and give not thine heritage to reproach that the heathen should rule over them. Wherefore should they say among the people, Where is their God? Then the Lord will be jealous for his land and pity his people. Where, where was the, the call to, a, to sanctify yourself and the holy convocation? Where was it? September 7th. September 7th. The, the curtain was removed. We've seen the circumstances we were in. And let the priests weep between the porch and the temple. Okay? When that happens, then the Lord will be jealous. Okay, now His jealousy is going to be manifested. And what's He going to do? He's going to choose Jerusalem. Right? And He's going to remove far off from you the northern army. Was there a northern army that was close to us? Have they been removed? Do, do you realize that the, they're saying that um, international travel, uh, if it starts back up on the airlines over, if it starts back up over the next couple months, that virtually anywhere you want to go, that when you go, you're going to be quarantined at, at the place you're going to for two weeks. What's that do? What does that do to two, the two captains of the Northern Army in terms of traveling the world? They've been removed far off. They ain't going nowhere. They go into the cities in fulfillment of the Omega prophecy and do a wonderful work. But it's them. The leaders of this movement go into the cities and do a wonderful work. The leaders of that movement have been restrained. Amen. And the leader of this movement had this particular broadcast set up in place Amen. in advance Amen. of the crisis. The leader didn't have it set up. God has it set up. That is the leader. Thank you. That is the leader. Okay, so we're to gather together. When are we to gather together? Zephaniah 2, 1 and 2. Gather yourselves together. Yea, gather together, O nation not desired, before the decree bring forth, before the day passes chaff, before the fierce anger of the Lord come upon you, before the day of the Lord's anger come on you. When are you supposed to gather together? I'm saying we gather together at midnight. And when are you supposed to gather together and weep between the, the altar and the porch? Before July 18th. Before the day of the Lord. Chapter 4 of Zechariah. All we're doing is trying to put chapter 5 in context. Chapter 4. We've dealt with chapter 4 of Zechariah over and over again in this message. Zechariah wakes up. He doesn't know what the candlestick is. The Millerites wake up at midnight. They don't know what the heavenly sanctuary is. But for us, then he answered, this is Zechariah, and, and please notice, it starts with Zechariah 4.6. The main verse six. is 46. Then he answered and spake unto me... It's 6 through 10. Then, then he answered and spake unto me, saying, This is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel, saying, Not by might, nor, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of the host. There's a doubling. Grace, grace in there. And then it says, Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this house, and his hand shall also finish it. The... The, the person that was chosen to lay the foundation of this movement is the same person that puts the capstone on. When's the capstone put on? At midnight. That's when Jerusalem's being chosen. Zechariah is telling us there is no ch change in appointed leadership, at least through the midnight chiasm. No matter what the Omega movement might say. And the Midnight chiasm is the midnight cry for the priest, preceded by the counterfeit midnight cry on September 29th. And that's why it's saying grace, grace. Not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. Okay, so these are the, the chapters. August 29th. August 29th, what did I say? September 29th. August 29th. These, these are the chapters that lead to chapter 5. And 
I'm saying that not only is the priesthood restored when Jerusalem is chosen, but also, it's about church and state, also the throne of David. Okay, so Isaiah 9, 6, and 7 says, For unto us a child is born, and unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, that's state, and his name shall be Wonderful. Where is Christ's name Wonderful? Palmoni. His name shall be called Wonderful. Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of His government and peace there shall be no end upon the throne of David and upon His kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and justice from henceforth even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. So when He's choosing Jerusalem, when He's plucking Zechariah out of the fire, when he's bringing the midnight cry message, it's accomplished by the zeal, the jealousy of God. All right? That's chapter 4 of Zechariah. Now we want to remind ourselves of jealousy that Daniel was teaching us for a few presentations not so long ago. Review and Herald, December 1st, 1896. No man can make an offering to the Lord in righteousness until practical right doing is brought into the daily life. This is one of the quotes about Zechariah 5 that I told you to read, that I've been repeating. And she asked this question. When does the Lord say that the offering of Judah and Jerusalem shall be pleasant unto him as in former years? She's asking when. I'm asking you, where does he say that? Malachi chapter 3. Verses 1 through 4, after he purifies the sons of Levi, then there is a, an offering as in former years. So she's saying, when does this take place? And, but she's going to quote from Zechariah chapter 5. And Zechariah 5, chapter 5 is talking about the point in time where earth's history, everybody is filling their cup of probationary time. God's people, God's former covenant people, the foolish priest, the United States, and the ten kings. Their cup is all filling up in Zechariah chapter 5. And she asked the question, When does the Lord say that the offering of Judah and Jerusalem shall be pleasant unto him as in former years? When he shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver, and he shall purify the sons of Levi, and purge them as gold and silver, that they might offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. Okay. He is the messenger of the covenant in Malachi chapter 3. Okay. Now, in Zechariah 1.14... It says, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I am jealous for Jerusalem and for Zion with a great jealousy. There's two examples of jealousy, human examples, three actually, if you want to treat Christ as um, taking a humanity upon him. But the first one we dealt with on September 7th, right off the bat, Phineas. Okay? In terms of defining what jealousy is. Phineas means the mouth of the serpent, or some close facsimile. That, that sounds almost satanic, right? Phineas is a good guy, but he's the mouth of the serpent. But who else was a serpent? I don't know if I can say this. Moses had serpents. Yeah, that's what I'm getting to. What did they have to do to heal the poison from the serpent bites? They had to lip, look to the cross. They had to look to the cross, to that brazen serpent. So there's a level where Christ is the serpent. If that's not blasphemous for you. Okay, and Phineas is his mouthpiece. Cosby, who's going to be in this story, means falsehood, a lie, to deceive. Strong delusion. Zimri means musical, to make music. We know this. We begin recognizing this at September 7th. So in Numbers 25, 10 through 15... What I want you to see is the Lord's zeal, His jealousy being manifested by human being. Just for the record, you said Cosby was his mouthpiece, it was Phineas. No, I meant Phineas was his mouthpiece. Yeah, I know. Okay, and Cosby and Zimri yeah. are the church-state combination yeah. that are the strong delusion and that are the de deceivers by the musician, okay? 
And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the priest, hath turned my wrath from the children of Israel, while he was zealous for my sake among them, that I consume not the children of Israel in my jealousy. You're seeing zealous and jealousy in this passage. Wherefore say, Behold, I give unto him my covenant of peace. All the Bible prophets are speaking about the end of the world. Phineas is the 144,000 that enter into covenant with the Lord. He is a priest, and he shall have it, and his seed after him, even the covenant of the everlasting priesthood, because he was zealous for his God and made an atonement for the children of Israel. At midnight, when this is going on, it's the closing scenes of the Day of Atonement. Now the name of the Israelite that was slain, even that was slain with the Midianitish woman, was Zimri, the son of Salu. Zimri means musical, to make music, okay? Like the Pied Piper, the deceiver. And music are based upon these chords that parallel the line upon line. Or like David played for... Um, a prince of a chief house among the Simeonites and the name of the Midianite women, woman that was slain was Cosby, the daughter of Zur. He was the head of over a people and of the chief house of Midian. Cosby is the strong delusion, the deceiver, the lie that they believe to receive the strong delusion. But zealous and jealousy, interchangeable. So how does God illustrate through a human being his jealousy. He does so in a crisis when two classes of worshipers are being separated in the time period of a combination of church and state. Cosby and Zimri. Okay, For us, 9-7 to 1-11. Elijah also illustrates God's jealousy. And if you know the story of Elijah, and you should, and we have to step fast, you'll notice I have April 7th, 2019 to July 18th, 2020. This is 1 Kings 18. The whole story, 1 Kings 18, is in July, April 7th, 2019 to July 18th, 2020. Okay, in 1 Kings 18, Elijah's going to go to Carmel. The Lord's going to bring fire down on his offering. And then in chapter 19, he's going to be confronted with the, the decree of Jezebel. He, you're going to be dead by tomorrow, this time tomorrow. And he flees into the wilderness. So chapter 19 is about that. And I'm just going to take a a verse out of 18 and 19, so you can see something, in connection with Ezra 7, 9. Chapter 18, verse 31, And Elijah took twelve stones, according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob, upon whom the word of the Lord came, saying, Israel shall be thy name. And then in chapter 19, verse 18, it says, Yet, have I, yet I have left me seven thousand in Israel, all the knees which have not bowed unto Baal, and every mouth which has not kissed him. So, 1 Kings 18 and 19 is illustrated or structured upon Ezra 7, 9. 120 days to get from Babylon to Jerusalem, and 70 days to get from Jerusalem to the Day of Atonement, October 22nd, 1844. And the 12 stones are the priest, and the 70 that haven't bowed a knee are the Levites. And the transition is at the midnight cry. And it's important to see this transition because so many people in this movement that have lost their way, including the final manifestation, claim to be Elisha. They claim to be Elisha. And Elisha is part of the 7,000. And he doesn't show up until after Carmel. Okay? So, how did Elijah illustrate God's jealousy, you'll see it's a doubling. It's a doubling. In verses 10 and verse 14 of chapter 19, the Lord's going to ask him twice, what are you doing here? He's running from Jezebel. There's a lot in chapter 19 and a lot of chapter 18. But in chapter 10 and 14, it's a doubling. So this is, this is our history, Midnight Cry history. It's the history of midnight all over again, just like Phineas was the history of midnight. 
right? So what is doubled? The whole thing. It says, What doest thou here, Elijah? And he said, I've been very jealous for the Lord of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, and slain thy prophets with thy sword. And I, even I only, am left, am left, and they seek my life to take it away. When was he very jealous? At, at Carmel. The whole story from April 7th to He's been very zealous in that history. Jealous. Why April 7th? Why April? That's what she's going to ask. Why, Why April? April 7th? Yeah. Because there was, there's a period of hiding that precedes five months. September 7th. It's five months. And the last presentation that was done here in this school, at this camp meeting, was on April 7th. And it was 150 days later that takes you to September 7th. All right. So, he's going to tell him to anoint, God's going to tell Elijah here to anoint three people. This is 1 Kings 19, 15 through 18. And notice that verse 19 is a doubling, 19, 19. And the Lord said unto him, Go, uh, the, uh, the, the verse has got to be off here uh, as I was cutting and paste and stuff. It's in 1 Kings 19, all these verses I'm going to read. And 19.19 19 is correct, but I've missed something. So don't, don't refer to the, the verses. And the Lord said unto him, Go return on thy way to the wilderness of Damascus, and when thou comest, anoint three people, Hazael to be king over Syria, and Jehu the son of Nimshi shalt thou anoint to be king over Israel, and Elisha, the son of, son of Shaphat. Okay? Now, as he gets through the conclusion of telling Elijah to anoint these three persons, he says, Yet I've left me 7,000. This is where he's saying, I've got the Levites standing in the quarters. Okay? All the knees which have not bowed unto Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. So when you get to 1919, which is the doubling of the midnight cry when this is all taking place, so he departed thence and found Elisha. He's got to anoint Elisha at the midnight cry. Okay. Who was plowing with twelve yoke of oxen before him, and he with the twelfth. And Elijah passed by and cast his mantle upon him. So anyone that wants to say, I'm Elisha, before you get to August 29th and the false midnight cry message or September 7th and the true midnight cry message. Anyone wants to say that I'm Elisha and I'm the messenger that follows Brother Jeff. It's not prophetically accurate. And if it's not prophetically accurate, it's error. It's darkness. Sister White has a comment on the calling of Elisha. And she starts by saying, we would do well to consider the case of Elijah when chosen for his work. Next paragraph. So we're stepping fast. When Elijah looked, the land he saw was owned by one man, a man who had not bowed the knee to Baal, whose heart had remained undivided in the service of God. Even during the captivity, there were souls who had not gone into apostasy. And this family was included in the 7,000 who had not bowed the knee to Baal. The owner of the land was Shaphat. That's the father of Elisha. Okay, next paragraph. The attention of Elijah was attracted to Elisha, the son of Shaphat, who with the servants was plowing with twelve oxen. Okay, so he, he's going to anoint Elijah. He's going to anoint Haziel. Uh, so who would Haziel be? Who's going to give us friction? If we're following, if we're walking with Elijah and Elisha, who's going to, who's going to chastise God's people? Initially, right off the bat. Well, government of the United States and the Seventh-day Adventist Church. So, in this context here, in our history, Hazel is the United States. The patience of God has an object, but you are defeating it. He is allowing a state of things to come that you fain see counter you will f that you would fain see counteracted by and by, but it will be too late. God commanded Elijah to anoint the cruel and deceitful Hazael, king over Syria, that he might be a scourge to idolatrous Israel. Who knows whether God will not give you up to deceptions you love? 
The latter rain message includes Isaiah 7, doesn't it? Yes. Yeah, I mean, it's locked in with Raphi and Paneum. And Isaiah's just been ordained in chapter 6, and then he's in 742. He's there, and who's he interacting with? An alliance between God's people, as represented by wicked king Ahaz, and who else? Yes. Haziel, king of Syria. That's Isaiah 7, isn't it? Yes. yes, okay, so this is another application of Haziel. So when Elijah's dealing with a church, Ahaz, and Haziel, and Isaiah is dealing with a church and a state, who is he dealing with in this history? Haziel is the United States. Now notice, what is the United States in terms of the beast, dragon, and false prophet? Okay, it's not the dragon, right? It's a false prophet. Reading on. Who knows whether God will not give you up to the deceptions you love? Who knows but that the preachers who are faithful, firm, and true may be the last who shall offer the gospel of peace to our unthankful churches. It may be that the destroyers are already training under the hand of Satan and only wait for the departure of a few more standard bearers to take their places. And with the voice of the false prophet... This is Haziel, the voice of the false prophet. Cry, peace, peace, when the Lord has not spoken peace. I seldom weep, weep, but now I find my eyes blinded with tears. They are falling upon my paper as I write. It may be that ere long all prophesying among us will be at an end, and the voice which has stirred the people may lo no longer disturb their carnal slumbers. When, the, when God shall, do, shall work His strain work upon, on the earth, <coughs> when holy hands shall bear the ark no longer, woe will be upon the people. <coughs> when, when does God do His strange work? Okay, the next, the next quote from Review and Herald, March 9, 1886, tells you it's at the Sunday Law. Okay, that's when God does His strange work. We're not leaving this passage from Testimonies and uh, volume 5, page 77. At the Sunday law, when God shall do his strange work, when holy hands bear the ark no longer. What holy hands are not going to bear the ark no longer at the Sunday law? In our history, the Seventh day Adventist church. Okay, that's Jehu. Okay, they're going to bear the ark no longer. And what marks when that takes place? Woe. When woe is upon the people. What's woe? Islam. Islam. July 18th. Woe is upon the people. Seventh-day Adventist church has just agreed to the first Sunday law that marks the image of the beast testing time. Okay, and they bear the ark of God no longer. And now it's time for God to do His strange act. Okay. Um, next paragraph, Jehu, Adventism. Now, i got to remind you that I'm lining these things up with the Midnight Cry on July 18th, but that means they have an application to the Sunday Law on December 25th, 2021, right? Because you got the image of the beast testing in the United States followed by the image of the beast testing in the world. Therefore, what goes on on July 18th, Sunday Law, woe time period, when they bear the Ark of God no longer, it goes on also at the Sunday Law in the United States. And therefore, it also went on, it also went on at 9-7 through January 11th in the history of the priests. You follow me? Is 9-7 a Sunday law? Yeah. Yes. Yes, it is. That was the separation of the foolish priest and the wise priest. So you have to see Jehu, Elisha, and Haziel in each of those three entities. We've been teaching that for a long time now. Yeah, and the, the apostate movement uh, bore the ark no longer. No longer bore the... They broke the law of God. Okay, so... Here's what Daniel cemented home from us so, so long ago from Exodus 34, 10 through 16. It's a 
a counsel from Moses about not making a covenant with the people of the land. And in the center of that paragraph, those verses, it says, For thou shalt worship no other God for the Lord, whose name is jealous, is a jealous God. I'm in the center of page 7. So what I'm saying is, when Phineas dealt with Cosby and Zimri, it was an illustration of God's jealousy. When Elijah dealt with the prophets of Baal and the priest of Grove in Carmel, it was an illustration of God's jealousy. And God's name is jealous, therefore his character is jealous. Uh, he is a jealous God. And Exodus 20, verses 4 through 6, Second Commandment, says that along with being a jealous God, emphasizing not making an image, that he's going to visit the iniquity upon the children and to the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. Okay, which allows us to bring the four generations into the story, which we have to bring in because of Genesis 7.15. And it's in this history that the Lord is going to execute his vengeance. Vengeance is mine. And Nahum backs this up. Up in the third and fourth generation, his, his vengeance will be manifested. Nahum means to breathe, comfortable. Nahum would be a symbol of the Holy Spirit, the latter rain. The burden of Nineveh, the book of the vision of Nahum, the Elkoshite. It's the burden of Nineveh. Nineveh carries with it what? A time prophecy message. Uh, God is jealous, and the Lord revenges the Lord revengeance. There's a, there's a doubling there. And is furious. The Lord will take vengeance on his adversaries, and he reserveth wrath for his enemies. The Lord is slow to anger and great in power, and will not at all acquit the wicked. The Lord hath his way in the whirlwind and in the storm, and the clouds are the dust of his feet. So the Lord's vengeance begins at the midnight cry against the enemies that have filled their cup and their cups are filled progressively in the story of Egypt when Genesis 15 was fulfilled first the Hebrews filled their cup at Passover then Pharaoh filled his cup in the Red Sea and thereafter the Amorites filled their cup okay it's progressive where does it begin where does judgment begin where, so where was the first cup filled? At the house of God. Where was it fulfilled? 1989. The house of God, Adventism, is passed by. Now he calls together a movement that become his covenant people, and now they are going to be judged. And as the priests are passed by, the Levites are passed by, the Nethanims are going to be passed by, and in the the nations are going to get passed by as well, beginning with the United States, then every country on the globe follows her example. There's a doubling about uh, of the remnant that escapes from Jerusalem in the story of Isaiah. By the story of Isaiah, what I'm saying is in 2 Kings 19, 29-31, and in Isaiah 37, 30-32, it's the identical verses in both places. So you got a doubling in 2 Kings and Isaiah. You follow me? Yes. And so the doubling, this is midnight cry, it says, And this shall be a sign unto thee. Ye shall eat this year such things as grow of themselves, and in the second year that which springeth of the same, and in the third year so eat and reap and plant vineyards and eat the fruits thereof. And the remnant that is escaped out of the house of Judah shall yet again take root downward and bear fruit upward. For out of Jerusalem, out of Jerusalem shall go forth a remnant, and they that escape out of Mount Zion, and how do they do it? For the jealousy, the zeal of the Lord of hosts shall do this. So when the Lord manifests his jealousy, He's going to bring a people out of Jerusalem that are going to be Jerusalem, that he's choosing is Jerusalem, that he's going to lift up, Isaiah 2, above all the mountains, and they will have a sign. What is this sign? What is this sign that's being referenced? It's the 2520, it's the 126. It's the Jubilee. This is the promise of the Jubilee. You go back into, the, into Isaiah 26, and there is a promise that if you will keep the Jubilee, that the Lord's not just going to give you the, the manna for 
on a double manna on Friday to take you through Sabbath, but when you celebrate the Jubilee, he's going to give you triple manna to take you through Friday, Sabbath, and Sunday. Only now we're talking in periods of years, and there's only two places where you're going to find this reference. Three. It's doubled here in these two places, and this takes you to Leviticus 26. What is the sign of the remnant? It's the 2520. Okay. And it's the sign of the midnight cry. And the midnight cry for us is put in place from September 7th to January 11th, which is 126 days, which is 126 years, which is 1260 years, which is 2520 years. It is, it is the sign of the midnight cry. Okay, we've done this many times. This next passage, I want you to see this about midnight. At midnight is where he is going to bring his vengeance, get his vengeance going up on the third and fourth generation. You follow that through. And in Ezekiel um, chapter 8, verses 1 through 6, I got highlighted for you 8-1 because of 81 being midnight. It says, And it came to pass in the sixth year and the sixth month and the fifth day of the month. That's one day before 666. It's a day before the Sunday law. Okay, and now in, in this chapter, he's going to give the four abominations. The image of jealousy, the secret chambers, the weeping for Tammuz, the false latter rain message, which is the third generation, and the fourth generation bows down to the sun. But what I want you to see is in this passage, I don't know what verse it is without being in my Bible, it says, Behold, the glory of the Lord, of the God of Israel, was there according to the vision I saw on the plate. So Ezekiel saying, that the vision of Ezekiel 8 is the same vision as the vision of the plain. And if you go to Ezekiel 3, pardon me? It was verse 7. Pardon me? Okay, it, it, you, can, you can test it. It's one of the verses. But the vision of the four generations and the bowing down to the sun in Ezekiel 8.1, which I'm saying begins in 8.1 and 81 as a symbol of midnight, is the same vision as he received in chapter 3 because it was the vision of the plain. And in chapter 3 it says, And the hand of the Lord was there upon me, and he said unto me, Rise, go forth into the plain, and I will there talk with thee. Then I arose and went forth into the plain, and behold, the glory of the Lord stood there as the glory of the Lord I saw by the river Chebar. So the vision of the plain is the same vision as the vision Chebar. Okay, so I, Ezekiel 8 is the same vision as the vision of the plain, and they're both the same vision of the river Chebar. And if you go to Ezekiel 1 1, which is midnight, it says, Now, I came, now it came to pass in the 30th year, in the fourth month, in the fifth day of the month. And what was the fourth month and the fifth day in Millerite history? July 21st, midway between. And it's the 45th President of the United States, and it's the 30th year of this movement. Now it came to pass in the 30th year, in the fourth month, in the fifth day of the month, as I was among the captives by the river Chebar, that the heavens were open, and I saw the visions of God. So, this is opened up. These four generations, the sanctuary at midnight, it's all right there in that history. No man can make an offering to the Lord in righteousness until practical right doing is brought into the daily life. When, the, when does the Lord say that the offering of Judah and Jerusalem shall be pleasant unto him as in former years? When he shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver, and he shall purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver, that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. We've already read this quote once. I'm going back to it. When does this take place? I'm taking, saying it, it's taking place and in the midnight time period when the wise and foolish priests are being separated, among other things, and Jerusalem is being chosen. And it's in Malachi 3.3. And he shall sit as a refiner. I, I passed over John. I passed over several things. Psalm 69.9 says, For the zeal of thine house hath eaten me up, and the reproaches of them that reproached me are fallen upon me. This is the verse the disciples remember when Christ cleanses the temple. 
Now I'm saying that August 29th through January 11th was the cleansing of the temple. And this is where God manifests His jealousy, where He cleans house. Okay, in John 2, in the verse we go to more often than not is John 2.20, but in verses 17 through 21, it says, And the disciples remembered that it was written, The zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. Then answered the Jews and said unto him, What sign showest thou unto us, seeing that thou doest these things? Jesus answered and said unto them, Destroy this temple, and in three days will I raise it up. Then said the Jews, Forty and six years was this temple in building, and will thou rear it up in three days? But he spake of the temple of his body. The cleansing of the temple is associated with 2.20, the restoration of the temple, as illustrated in John 2.20, and the building of the temple in 46 years, 1798 to 1844, Moses receiving the instructions, on and on, Herod's temple, and the resurrection of Christ after three days. Um, so 346, 2.20, uh, the zeal of his house is the cleansing of the temple. And in Malachi 3.3, 3, he says, I will set as a refiner and purifier of silver, and he shall purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver, that they may offer unto the Lord an offering of righteousness. How do you purge gold and silver? In a fire. So where, where, how does he get the gold and silver? He plucks them out of the fire. They're a brand out of the fire in the final scenes of the investigative judgment, Zechariah chapter 3. So the, so the gold and the silver are the priests and the Levites. Cool. Why would you say that? Uh, I have a few quotes that kind of emphasize that. Okay, but in the next next reference here you got all of Malachi 3 1 through 4 behold I will send my messenger and he shall prepare the way before me and the Lord whom you suddenly seek shall suddenly come to his temple even the messenger of the covenant who you delight in behold he shall come there's a doubling there saith the Lord of hosts but who may abide the day of his coming and who shall stand when he appeareth for he's like a refiner's fire and like fuller soap and he shall set as a refiner and purifier of silver and he shall purify who who's the sons of Levi the priests and the Levites. It's, it's right there. And purge them as gold and silver, that they may offer unto the Lord an offering of, in righteousness. Then, then, shall the offering of Judah and Jerusalem be pleasant unto the Lord as in the days of old, as in former years. And Sister White asked the question up above in Review and Herald, when does the Lord say that the offering of Judah and Jerusalem shall be pleasant unto him as in former years, when he cleanses the temple at the time period in earth's history when the cup of iniquity is filling up for everyone concerned. You see it? Yes. So it's the second temple cleansing that we just went through. It's the first temple cleansing. Because Alton went through from 1989 to 9-11. Pulled out a, a band of priests. No, 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 no. The the, the two temple cleansings in, at, in Adventism were at the beginning of their history. Okay. Okay. The two temple cleansings okay. for us are priests and Levites. From from July eighteenth to December twenty fifth, there's going to be a temple cleansing of the Levites. Okay. If you want to see two temple cleansings, okay. And in. Uh, Great Controversy 426. Sister White's going to make this reference, and she refers to this passage in Malachi. She says, The coming of Christ as our high priest to the most holy place. Did Christ come to the most holy place on November 9, 2019? Well, yeah. He was, that was the final works of the investigative judgment in terms of 1844 days being one day. Okay, he's there. Um, for the cleansing of the sanctuary, was he cleansing the sanctuary? Yes, this is a temple cleansing. Brought to view in Daniel 8, 14. The coming of the Son of Man to the ancients of, the ancient of days is presented in Daniel 7, 13. When he comes to the Father in Daniel 7, 13, what does he come in with? With clouds. Okay. And the coming of the Lord to his temple foretold by Malachi are descriptions of the same event. And this is also represented as the coming of the bridegroom to the marriage, described by Christ in the parable of the ten virgins. All four of those things are fulfilled in this history and others. 
So now I'm switching gears as we bring this to a conclusion to the 120 and 70. He brings a pleasant offering out of this history of midnight. Okay? And in Ezra 7 9, the midnight cry message for us started back in 2013 14 when Ezra 7 9 is opened up. And what was opened up about Ezra 7 9 was the 120 and the 70, the time it took Ezra to get from Babylon to Jerusalem onward to the Day of Atonement. So we look at the 120, and in the 1 Kings 10 10, and 2 Chronicles 9 9, 10 10, 9 9, you got the same story about the Queen of Sheba giving, giving an offering. It says, And she gave the king 120 talents of gold and of spices, very great store. And in Chronicles 9 9, 2 Chronicles 9 9, it says that she gave the king 120 talents of gold. So here's gold as an offering. Where do we put the 120? In the history of the priests. Right? <clears throat> and the 70 is in the history of the Levites. 120 is a time, a, proba a probationary period. We all know this. Uh, Genesis 6, 3, 120 years. So from 9-11 until you get to the end of the 120 years, which is Jerusalem. <coughs> when Ezra arrives at Jerusalem, which is the midnight cry. When you get to midnight, the midnight chiasm, it's a probationary time. And some people are going to wake up and find they don't have any oil in their vessels. That the door's shut. Okay? And so you know that 120. Now this one, if you have, the, if, if you have it, a little bit of mental energy left in you to follow this through, I could put it on the board, but I'm not going to. It is with an earnest longing that I look forward to the time when the events of the day of Pentecost. What is Pentecost? It's a Sunday law. Okay? Falls 50 days after what? The, the feast of uh, the Passover feast of unleavened bread and first fruits. 50 days later is Pentecost. We understand the Sunday law to be Pentecost. Okay? She's waiting for the events of Pentecost to be repeated with even greater power than on that occasion. John says, I saw another angel come down from heaven having great power and the earth was lightened with his glory. Then is at the Pentecostal season, the people will hear the truth spoken to them, every man in his own tongue. 9-11 ushers in a period that's leading to Pentecost. Is there a resurrection at 9-11? Yes. Is there a crucifixion? Yes. The cross is there at 9-11. Okay. So is... From 9-11 to the Sunday Law, whether you're applying it to the priests, the Levites, or the world, was 9-11 to the Sunday Law 120 days? Yes. Is it a probationary period? Noah says yes. The probationary period begins at 9-11. When the angel of Revelation 18 descends, heading to Pentecost. Then, as at the Pentecostal season, the people will hear the truth spoken to them, every man in his own tongue. God can bring new life into every soul that sincerely desires to serve Him. Ezekiel 37. Where's Ezekiel 37? Where do they get breathed upon? 9-11. To those that seek to serve Him. And can touch the lips with a live coal from off the altar. Isaiah 6. When's that take place? 9-11. Why? Verse 3 of Isaiah 6 says what? What do the angels say in verse 3 of Isaiah 6? Which is what? Which is what? It's 63. Okay. <laughs> Which I just thought of. But holy, 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 the earth is full of His glory. 9-11. Pardon me? Genesis 6-3 as well. Genesis 6-3 as well. Yes. <laughs> Okay, and cause them to become eloquent in His praise. Thousands of voices will be imbued with power to speak forth the wonderful truths of God's Word. The stammering tongue will be unloosed, Isaiah 28, and the timid will be made strong to bear courage to the testimony of truth. When is the Isaiah 28 put in place? It's the latter rain message, line upon line. May the Lord help His people to cleanse the soul temple from every defilement, Malachi 3, 1 through 4 and to maintain such a close connection with Him that they may be partakers of the latter rain when it shall be poured out. 
Revelation 18. So if you're going to just put it in the context of Revelation 18, verse 1 is 9-11, verse 4 is the Sunday law. In verse 4 it says, come out of her, my people. So she's, she's emphasizing all these things as a progressive manifestation of power that leads to the Sunday law. And this probationary period of 120 years, 120 days, is a progressive period of time. Now, what happens at the conclusion? A dispensational change. And you can see the 120 Levites and the cloud filled the temple in 2 Chronicles 5, 1 through 3, 11 through 14. In Daniel 7, 13, the Lord comes with clouds, a dispensational change at the end of the 120 days. What's the dispensational <coughs> change? He separated the wise and foolish virgin. He has chosen Jerusalem. He is establishing the throne of David. Priests and Levites, you see the two temple cleansings. The prophet says, I saw another angel come down from heaven having great power and the earth was lightened with his glory. And he cried mightily with a strong voice saying, Babylon the great has fallen, has fallen, has become the habitations of devils. This is the same message that was given by the second angel. Babylon has fallen because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. What is that wine? Her false doctrines. She has given to the world a false Sabbath instead of the Sabbath of the fourth commandment and has repeated the falsehood that Satan first told Eve in Eden the natural immortality of the soul. Many kindred doctrines she has spread far and wide, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. When Jesus began his public ministry, he cleansed this temple from its sacrilegious profanation. She just referenced 9-11, a beginning of a temple cleansing. But she's going to say there's two calls to the churches. And if you're going to plug this into Millerite history, when does the first temple cleansing begin? August 11th, 1840. The Protestants are in a temple cleansing. When does their temple cleansing end? April 19th. What begins on April 19th? The second temple cleansing from April 19th to October 22nd. The cleansing of the Millerites. First the covenant people, then the Millerites. In our history, we got priests and Levites. Among the last act of his ministries was the second te temple cleansing of the last of the temple. So in the last work for warning of the world, two distinct calls are made to the churches. The second angel's message is Babylon has fallen, has fallen that great city because she made all nations drink of the wine of, the wrath of her fornication. And in the loud cry of the third angel's message, that's the Sunday law, a voice is heard from saying, Come out of her, my people, that you be not partaker of her sins and that you receive not of her plagues. For her sins have reached into heaven and God hath remembered her iniquities. In whether you've you got to apply this to the priest and the Levites, but you can also apply it to the, the judgment that is being marked against Adventism. When is the judgment marked publicly against Adventism? It's just after 9-11, when these two charts come into history. He's now taken a movement back to the old past, and he's revealed that Adventism lost its way in 1863 by setting aside the old past. That was the church of Ephesus. Thy, thy lost thy first love, you need to return to your first love. They never did. So at 9-11, he brings these two tables and puts them on the wall. And who becomes the symbol of that rejection? Belshazzar. It's the handwriting on the wall. But it's also the handwriting on the wall in these other temple cleansings. Because what is Belshazzar's handwriting on the wall? Many, many tekel you farsen. It's the 2520, the 126. It's the 63. It's the 1260. Okay. When he, the previous quote, she says, when he cleansed the temple, he cleansed the temple of its sacrilegious profanation. In Prophets and Kings 522, little did Belshazzar think that there was a heavenly witness to his idolatrous revelry that a divine watcher unrecognized looked upon the scene of profanation Sacrilegious profanation. The scene of profanation heard the sacrilegious mirth, beheld the idolatry. But soon the uninvited guest made his presence felt. When the revelry was at its height, when they passed spiritual formation as a job requirement, 
When the revelry was at its height, a bold hand came forth and traced upon the walls of the palace characters that gleamed like fire, which were words which, though unknown to the vast throng, were a portent of doom to the now conscious stricken king and his guest. And that very night, he slain. When probation comes, it will come suddenly and unexpectedly. Next paragraph, middle of the paragraph. <coughs> the coming of the Lord to his temple was sudden and unexpected to his people. They were not looking for him there. That was October 22, 1844. Third paragraph. Character is revealed by a crisis. Both parties were taken unaware, but one was prepared for the emergency and the other was found without preparation. Character is revealed by circumstances. Emergencies bring out the true metal of character. Some sudden and unlooked for calamity, bereavement, or crisis. Some unexpected sickness or angry. Something that brings the soul face to face with death will bring out the true inwardness of character. It will be made manifest whether, she's going to say whether three times, or not there's any real faith in the promises of God, the Word of God. It will be made manifest whether or not the soul is sustained by grace, whether there's any oil in the vessel with the lamp. So all those weathers can be put together line upon line. If you have oil in your vessel, you're sustained by grace because you believe in it, thus saith the Lord. If you don't believe in it, thus saith the Lord, you're going to have a crisis at midnight that demonstrates that. That's what we've seen in this movement. It's almost done I'm dealing with 120 and 70, Ezra 7, 9, how the 120 and 70 impact our history. But 120 is also 123. Why would I say that? Because Moses and Aaron died the same year, didn't they? Did they die the same year? Yeah. Yes, they did. How old was Aaron when he died? 123. How old was Moses? 120. Okay. And in those days, uh, I, I, I still had to do some 120s. Okay, I'm oh, sorry. And in those days, Peter stood up in the midst of his disciples and said the number of the names together were about 120. Is this before or after Pentecost? Is, now or I'll ask it this way. Is this before or after the Sunday law? This is before. This is before. Okay, you go read it in Acts 1.15. It, afterwards is going to be the classic statement in 2.1 of Acts when the day of Pentecost was fully come. Okay, they're having a meeting before the Sunday law where they're going to replace Judas okay, with Matthias. And they appointed two. Joseph called Barsabbas, who was surnamed Justice. Notice that this guy has three names. He's not going to get chosen. And Matthias... And they prayed and said, The Lord, which knowest the hearts of all men, show whether of these two thou hast chosen, that he may take part of this ministry and apostleship, from which Judas by transgression fell, that he might go to his own place. And they gave forth lots, and the lot fell upon Matthias, and he was numbered with the eleven apostles. Matthias means gift of God. Who's Matthias? He's the offering. He's the gift that comes out of the, the temple cleansing. Okay, he, he may be the final, final priest, or something along that line, but who is Joseph? He has three names. He has a Hebrew name, Barabbas, the son of, which is Chaldean, and Justice, Latin. This guy is a combination of Hebrew, Greek, and Latin. Right? Do you see that? His name's Joseph, which means Ad. Uh, he's called Barsabbas, son of an army. It's Chaldean word. And he, his surname was Justice, which is a Latin word, which means just. What's that make you think of? Hebrew, Greek, and Latin. The cross. Okay, so... Where's the cross? 9-11? Right in the middle of midnight. 
there's a choice being made between two. One's the cross, symbolizing the cross, and the other's the gift that comes out of that temple cleansing. Now to the 123s, okay? Moses dies at 120, and the leadership passes to Joshua. Okay, so where's 120? It's at the midnight cry. So can you have a new leadership before the midnight cry? Not, not in terms of the, the state. Not in terms of the throne of David. Moses was the, the political leader. His brother, who died at 123 at the same year, was the religious leader. He was the high priest. Aaron died at 123, and, high priest, as, and the high priesthood passed to Eliezer. Okay, Aaron means lofty, exalted, high mountain. Eliezer means God's protector. It's Lazarus in the Greek. Who's God's protector? Who's the protector of God? The Holy Spirit is the protector. Okay, Lazarus is a symbol of the Holy Spirit. The transition that takes place at the midnight cry, the religious leadership is handed off to the Holy Spirit. What did Zechariah 4.6 say? Not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. Moses means drying out of the water. Joshua means God saves. In the Greek, it's Jesus. So the leadership of Moses and Aaron, human beings that die at the same time, one at 120, one 123, they die at the midnight cry, is handed off to the King David, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit, Lazarus. Abraham was 120 years old when this terrible startling command came to him in a vision of the night. He was to travel three days journey and would have an ample time for reflection. Fifty years previous at the divine command, he had left father and mother, relatives and friends and become a pilgrim and a stranger in the land not his own. He was 120 years old, but he had a three-day test, 123. What was our three-day test in the context of what we've been looking at? 9-7, November 9th, January 11th, three touches, midnight chiasm. In Daniel 6, you have the ceiling, 120 princes and three presidents, actually two presidents, because Daniel, Daniel was one of the presidents, but you have this 123 and they turn on Daniel and they have him thrown in with the lions and what does the king do? He puts his seal up on that stone that covers the pit. Daniel was sealed. When are you sealed? At the Sunday law. What's the Sunday law? It's the midnight cry. The first Sunday law. It's the ceiling. It all fits together, line upon line. Okay, I'm glad I put that in the record. I needed to get that out of the way. Yeah, go ahead. I just wanted to add, 123, it just so happens that May 2nd, the, the symbol of Snow's letter, which was Sabbath, was the 123, 123rd day of the year as well. I don't know if that means anything, but it was 2520 as well. Since we emphasize February for Trump, maybe that's something there with Snow's letter. It's also the 123rd day of the year. Interesting. And Moses was 70 when he left his father years old. Which you got the 120 and the 70. Right there and right there. there. Yeah, and when it says that, you mean not Moses, Abraham. Abraham, sorry. Abraham, yeah. Thank you. And he left 50 years earlier. Yes. Yeah, so you get the 70 and the, and the, the, the 120 all in there, but you also get the 50. Okay, yeah, there's a lot of stuff in there once you start looking closely. Okay, I was going to do some of that based upon what we went through. I'll do that next time. We stepped fast. Seems to me that we need to step fast. Um, we're running out of time in a, in a multitude of ways. Shall we pray? Father in heaven, we thank you that you've allowed us to see these truths and we understand that we have been represented by Joshua and that the work of removing the filthy garments is your work and of course we need to participate in it but we want to be among those that are typified in 
and Zechariah 3 that are standing for your glory and your honor in the time period that you're choosing Jerusalem when the cup of iniquity is being filled during the time period that you're cleansing the temple and, and the separation process of first Adventism, then priesthood, then Levites, then Nethanism, Nethanims takes place. We thank you for the privilege of being in this history. We thank you that you're opening these things up to us. Give us the, the energy to do our part in bringing these things, these truths into our lives and the willingness to humble ourselves that we might be uh, pliable in your hands to wherever you may direct. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen.